Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 12 through 20. I invite you to read that in your copy of scripture or follow along on the screen as we read this. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit and all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not, of the, I'm not part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange would a body be if it had, if it had only one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. Let's pray together. Father, as we come together today, God, we ask you to speak. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to see how each and every one of us is different, but God, how you have fit us together, how you have brought us together to be one body, and what it means, God, to what does it mean to be a church? How does it? How do we go about the business of being a church together as you are leading us? Lord, we love you, and we ask this, that you would guide us in this conversation. In Jesus' name, Amen. The late great comedian, early comedian, star, of film, television, Groucho Marx, uh, once had this encounter with a country club. His young daughter went with some of her friends to go to the swimming pool there, but she was denied entry because she was not a member. And the country club, when they found out it was Groucho Marx's daughter, was, was really embarrassed by the whole thing and said, Mr. Marx, please, please, please submit an application to, to join our country club. And his remark was, well, I never want to be a part of any club that would want me as a member, was his first response. But they kept pleading. They said, please, 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 let someone else fill out an application and submit it for you. So finally, Marx relented and someone submitted an application to the leadership of the country club. Well, the club was further embarrassed because at the time, things were not as egalitarian as they are now. And the Marx family was rejected because he was Jewish. And to which Groucho Marx, never letting things slide, responded to the country club, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. My wife's not Jewish. Can she join your club? And, you know, and can she take my daughter swimming? And, and, and my wife can go swimming all the way, but my daughter will only weigh, wade in waist deep because she's just half Jewish. You know, and so I bring that up today because we are going to spend a month long time talking about what it means to be a part of a church. What does it mean to say, this is the place that God has called me. What does it mean to, to serve in the church? What does it mean? We'll talk about various aspects on the surface of what it means about being a member of the church. What does it mean to really and truthfully be connected? And as we begin to explore this this morning, we're going to begin with the big question. What does it mean to simply be a part of the church? And Paul explains this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is where we're going to go in a minute as we explore this. And what we're going to find today, very simply, as a beginning point for this conversation, is that to be a part of the church, to be a part of the body of Christ, is to function, to have a purpose, to come and participate and be involved. So that's what we're going to find as we dive in to our text this morning, where Paul says, you are the body of Christ. And the amazing thing about this particular body is that it's different. It's diverse. Some of you were born Jewish. Some of you were born Gentile. Some of you were, were slaves. Some of you were free. But the important thing is, not where you began, but where you are now. That you are one body. And just as the body has many parts, so does your church have many parts. 
God brought them together. They fit together in a certain way that God intended. And if that's the case, if the, if the example of the body is what informs our, how we do church and moves us forward, then the parts of the body shouldn't look at other members of the body and say, you know what? Because I'm not, it's not fair that I'm not the eye, you know? So I'm not a part of the body because I don't have this place of prominence. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Your eyes can't get up and just jump off your face and walk off. In the same way, you know, the the ears can't say, well, I, I'm not as important as the arms, so I, I just don't fit in anymore. You know, you can't do things like that. God brought the body together. He's the one that holds it together. In the same way, even if the, let's just, uh, for instance, if the body was an eye, and that's all it was, one, that would be really strange, and two, how would it hear? You know, if your body was only a big giant ear, how would you smell? And so along those lines, the body is different parts with different functions that God has placed together. And so you too are one body with many parts that fit together intricately. So one of the challenges in speaking about this and talking about what it means to be a part of a church, how do we function, how do we, how do we fit together, is to acknowledge one of the great strengths of our congregation, that we come from all kinds of different places. When I first came here, Ron Mallow, who is the interim, said to me, the greatest strength that Seven Lock has is its diversity, that you have people from most of the world that worship you. And that's one of the great strengths. And for me, and Alma coming from Texas, we longed to pastor a church that was diverse for many different reasons. But one being because when you when you have people from all over, you have different flavors, you have different experiences, different perspectives on what it means to relate to God. And that's so wonderful. It's beautiful. It's precious. Do you guys know that on any given Sunday, we have people worshiping with us from five different continents? That's fantastic. Five different continents. We are still praying for Australians. And, and if the Lord wills, a couple penguins. Because then we would have representation from all seven. And it's great. It, it's, you know that this is for many different reasons. We'll get super spiritual for one minute. Because this is what heaven is going to look like. Okay. Now that we've got the spiritual reason out of it, but it's fun because we all have these different ways of, of looking at faith and how God reached out to us, and some of us, God began our walk with Him in English. Others, it was different other other different languages: Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, you know, French, and that's just the name of a few. And I know I missed a couple, and I'm sorry. Dutch. There's uh, there's more. Okay, that's the great challenge and great thing about our church is that we come from everywhere. And do you know what's great about having a church where people come from everywhere? Everyone's welcome. Everyone can come here on any given Sunday and feel like they fit in because we're all from someplace else except for like four people. That's pretty awesome. You know how rare that is? In Texas, that doesn't happen. So to come here and have that, it's great. But our greatest strength is also our greatest challenge because when we have people who come from everywhere and come from different traditions, even those who were born and raised in the United States have come from different denominations, those who were born someplace else and came here, we all have different experiences. We have all have different understandings and backgrounds of the churches that we grew up in. So now we come together and we say, okay, we're going to be a church. But now we have to stop and we have to explain what that means and find common ground. Not that finding common ground is a challenge for us, because it really isn't. We, that's the great thing about our church. Everybody loves Jesus and they love each other and we just love each other and it works. But having that reference point of what does it mean to be connected, what does it mean to be a part of a church is one that we need to have. Now, in preparing this, I want to be honest with you. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and sought wisdom and counsel from various people about talking about what it means to be a part of a church for the reason that so often when we have discussions like this, it creates a lot of anxiety because 
we I don't know if you've ever heard of something like this, but I certainly have growing up. It's the emphasis, oh my gosh, we're going to have to talk about what God wants from us. What does God expect from us? And, and if we don't do it right, is everything going to be okay? Is God still going to let us into heaven? Is God, you know, going to bless us? Are we going to have a longer commute tomorrow because we didn't do everything right today? I mean, you know, and you just go on and on and on, and we have anxiety about that. What does God want from us? What God wants something for us, and if we don't give it to Him, is everything going to be okay? Plus, then too, when we talk about being connected in a church and, and talking about serving alongside one another and being a part of the body of Christ, sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, what does the church want me to do? Are they going to want me to get up and talk in front of people? Are they going to want me to teach a class? I don't know if I can drive a bus. I don't know if my walk with the Lord is good enough to work in the nursery because the kids may drive me crazy. I mean, I don't know. We have all of this anxiety that comes when we talk about this, because so often we look at our faith from a place of God wants something from us. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again in grace and all that good stuff. But deep down inside, because we're human beings, we still feel like God wants something from us. And, we, and, and there's this sense of obligation. There's this sense of guilt. And we have obligation and guilt. Guess what? Eventually you have anxiety. And then insomnia, which is not fun. But the thing is, is that really the mindset that God has called us to live in? I don't think so. Quite frankly, I think as we approach talking about what it means to be a part of a church family, to be involved, to be connected, it's not about what does God want from us. It's to really look at this and hear the words of the Apostle Paul saying, what does God want for us? Because as we're going to talk, we talked about this last Sunday as we were wrapping up our series on spiritual warfare. But it's just as true when we talk about being connected together as a body of Christ. Our faith is not simply about us. You know, in our 21st century culture, especially uh, American culture, we, we have made so much of our faith about our personal walk with the Lord. And look, I don't want to minimize that because that is definitely important. There should be a time daily where we are spending time in prayer with God, when we are studying the Scriptures, when we are interacting and inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit to to order and and lead our way through our days and, and how we relate to our family, our friends, our co-workers, how, you know, in fact, everything that we are, without a doubt, there is a personal element of that that is vital. But there's also a communal aspect where together, together, our faith is truly formed and truly shaped. And that's why I think that as we approach what it, what it means to be a part of a church, we really need to think, what is it that God wants for us? Well, God wants us to know that we're not alone. I mean, we talked about this last week, too, that Jesus said right before he went back to heaven, I am with you always to the very end of it. How is Jesus with us always? Well, you can say, well, he's with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit, without a doubt, that you can make a biblical argument for that. And I agree. There is a part of our faith where the Holy Spirit, I believe, when we accept Christ, ask forgiveness of our sins, that the Holy Spirit is present in our lives, in our hearts, directing us, leading us to grow more with Him. But I believe that God works to be present with us to the life of the church too, that Jesus is with us, that we come together because God wants us to know we're not alone. God wants us to grow. And there are certain parts of us that we can't grow without help. There, you know, just like you have, there are certain things that are within us that God has to pull out of us. And he does that with the Spirit. He does that with Scripture. But he also does it with other people. You know, some folks are real go-getters. Others are not. I mean, there are folks that are driven, and then there are procrastinators. And look, procrastinators are the leaders of tomorrow. You know, and so you need the driven people to connect with those who aren't. And so things get done. They are propelled forward. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He says, look, God wants you to be a part of a church. He wants you to connect. 
because it's together that we can truly grow. Now, here's the issue that Paul is dealing with in Corinth. This is a church that gave Paul fit. You know, a lot of people I've, I've joked about before, when we think about the Apostle Paul, who is the great teacher of the New Testament, and his importance in our faith is second only to Christ, okay? I mean, that Paul, God revealed himself. Jesus spoke through Paul. Paul is everybody's pastor, deep down inside. He's my pastor, has been for years, okay? So, but when we think about Paul, we think of him, you know, being real tough and looking like the rock of the first century. You know, he's buff and he's strong and all that good stuff. But a lot of scholars have said that Paul was short, a little chubby, and ball-headed. And I think the reason he was ball-headed was because the church in Corinth, they gave him fits because they were challenging. They were pulling and stretching on his face. And he was constantly having to, to deal with issues. And one of the issues that he dealt with is that the church in Corinth was one of the very first churches that came from a mostly pagan background. So and so coming out of this pagan worship into to something that was rooted both in Judaism but now was becoming Christianity, it was a great challenge for them. They didn't all know what it meant to be members of a church. And then you threw in the fact that as these people were were studying the scriptures and God was beginning to speak to them and the Holy Spirit was blessing them with very spiritual gifts. It became, a, it became apparent that certain people were good at certain things within the church in Corinth. Some of these things were that there were some who were great at preaching. There were some who were very gifted speakers. There were others who were, were great prayer warriors. There were other people who were people of great faith and, and great encouragers and those who were just great at sitting by someone while they were struggling and hurting. They were these various gifts. One of the other gifts was that people spoke in tongues. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a couple weeks, what that might mean. But for our conversation today, it suffice it to say that these were people who had a very ecstatic and very emotional experience with God. And they would often display that when the church worshiped together. And there began to become this division that the people who were gifted in this way, maybe they were closer to God than the people who weren't. And the reason for this was because within the, the pagan style of worship that they were all coming out of is that they emphasized this big emotional experience and everything that was super sensational, that was what was gravitated to in the pagan worship. Well, they come in, now they're Christians, now they're following Jesus, and they're starting to break up and segment again and saying, oh, look, these people are better than others. And Paul writes and says, no. That's honestly not the case. You guys are a body. You are, you are knit together for a reason. You all have different gifts. And guess which gift is important? The one given by God, which would be all of them. They all have a role. They all have a purpose. There are many gifts, Paul says, in the passage that George read you this morning, but one spirit. The spirit is the one that equips everyone. And that's why Paul writes, to them and says, you are the body of Christ. You come from different traditions. You come from different parts. But you're all knit together. You're brought together as God created you to be. One part, many different functions. And he says, you know which one is important? Every single one of them. Every one of them is vital. Every one of them brings something different to the table so that the body can thrive in the same way that our bodies are so complex. And one of the things that I, I've, I've picked up on is, is I've talked with Alma, who does a lot of research about um, and heard from other folks in the medical realm who, who reported different findings that they are still discovering so many things about the human body. Every day there's something new they figured out they didn't know the day before. And it's crazy stuff. I'm like, well, wow, our bodies are really, really complex. And so, with that said, every part of our body has a specific function that we need. We don't even know how complex we are yet. We're still figuring that out, and we never will figure everything out. I read something with Elliot about how an eyeball functions. It's so much more complex than just looking and seeing colors. There's a lot that goes in with neuroscience and 
and light reflection and all of these things have to happen for us to be able to see each other. And there are lots of little body parts that are unsung that people don't know about, but they fit together and they make it work. Respiratory system, digestive system, they're all the same. And, and that's even before we talk about the complexity of the human brain. They're all formed and they all have parts to play. Some parts are very visible. Some parts you see quite often. Others you don't. But Paul says in the same way that you need every part of your body to survive, we need one another to be the body of Christ. We all have different functions. If all of us had the same spiritual gift, we would be that much spiritually poor because we would be missing out on so many other parts of our lives. We all need to fit together so that we can function. And that's what Paul is really driving at here as he's explaining this to the Corinthians. He's saying, look, what part, what spiritual gift makes you a part of the body of Christ? Every single one of you. What's the, what makes you a part of the body of Christ? Well, more trusting in Jesus, asking forgiveness of your sins, realizing that you need His grace in your life. Once you've done that, you're there. You have become a part of the body. And God now is calling you to something more. God is giving you gifts. And God's expectation, and not just His expectation, but what He wants for you, is to function. You think about it in the morning. When you get up, what do you want from your body? You want it to work, right? You you hope that when you stand up, your feet and your legs are going to keep you there, right? You know, when you reach for something, you, you want to be able to get it, you know, especially if it's your toothbrush. Um, you know, in... You also, when you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes, you hope you see, right? You hope you hear, unless your kids are fighting, and then maybe you tune that out. But other than that, you want to be able to have these functions. When you when you drink your first cup of coffee or you take your bite of cereal or eggs, whatever it is you eat in the morning, you should eat, by the way. If you don't eat breakfast, you should. Okay, but whatever it is, when you taste something, don't you want your tongue to tell you if it tastes good or not? And if you don't, you think, wow, is the food bad or is there something wrong with me? We want our bodies to function. We want that for us because, well, we like to live. We like to experience life. And that is exactly the same thing that God has called us to. He brings us together. We come from different places. We have different gifts. And God says, I want you to come together because I want you to know me not just by yourself, but together because it's from each of you your gifts, your talents, your experiences, and how you know me individually, that together you know me as a family. And you're able to know me more, and more than that, as a family, you're able to proclaim my love and grace and mercy to the community around you that needs you. And you can do that together in ways you can't do that apart. And so what God wants for us to be a part of the church is to function. To work together, the great Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard remarked over a hundred years ago, even further back, that so often people, even in his day, approach worship as a performance. You know, this afternoon there is an athletic competition that's going to happen at 6:30. It it's so fantastic. Some people would even say it's super. Um, called the Super Bowl. A hundred million people are going to watch the Super Bowl. I'm one of them. Trust me. All right? It's a big deal. And now some people are going to watch the Super Bowl because they they either love Tom Brady and Bill Belichick and they want to see them tie the Steelers, or they can't stand Tom Brady and they want the upstart Rams to take them down, or they're Georgia fans and they want Todd Gurley to be the Super Bowl MVP. That's some people. More people are going to tune in to watch the halftime show. But even more people don't care about that. They're going to tune in to watch the commercial. And that's the reason they're there. But for whatever reason, a hundred million people are going to sit down in front of their television and eat various things. Most of them will be pizza and wings because that's what you do. If Jesus were here, that's what he'd say to do too, I think. Um, but either way, that's manna on Super Bowl Sunday, by the way. Um, either way, People are going to sit down to watch, to spectate. If somebody gets hurt in the first quarter, nobody's cell phone is ringing and saying, 
hey, uh, can you get on a plane to Atlanta like five minutes ago because we need you to play free safety for the rest of the game? That's not happening. You know what? If Maroon 5's guitarist can't play, nobody's calling. Nobody's cell phone is ringing saying, hey, we need you to come play bass. The dude can't go on. That's not going to happen. And the, and the commercials are filled. If Tony Romo has laryngitis, nobody's calling me to do the play-by-play, okay? All of us are going to be spectators. That's it. That is our involvement. And Kicker Guard's point years ago was, look, so often we take the exact same approach to how we do church, that we're here just to spectate, and that the the pastor, those who are leading in worship, all the people who are involved in the day-to-day function of how we do church, they're, they're the ones who are involved, and the rest of us are just here to hang out. And Kierkegaard said, no. You know, if you look at the Bible, it's the exact opposite. You know, if anything, the, the folks who are leading are there to encourage, to support, to prepare them as, as the church actively participates in worship. But that worship doesn't end when the service does and we walk out the doors. That's really when it begins. That's when every person is, is equipped and prepared to go out and use the gifts that God has called them to and given them to serve as the church. So as we talk this morning about what it means to be a part of a church, it's to understand that as we come together, God has called us to actively be participants. Just as the body has different parts, and in order for the body to live, it has to function, we have to function. We serve. Now, how we serve God in the church looks differently for all of us. And guess what? That's not okay. That's the way God intended it. God intended for us to have different gifts. God intended for us to do different things. God equipped those who were out in front to be comfortable being out in front or eventually get that way, while God equipped others to say, hey, you know what? I'll do the grunt work. Whatever it needs to be done, I want to do it for the glory of God. So, what does it mean to be a part of the church? It means to realize we're, we're each a part of the body and that we need each other and that everyone is important and has a role and has a place of service and it's not something that God expects from you, but it's something He wants for you so that you can grow, so that you can, together, we can grow as a church. And as we talk about this, we'll drill down further about it, what it means to be a part of the church as we go throughout this month. But I, I want to close by saying that God is gifted Each of you has a gift that's different. I have different gifts. You have different gifts. And guess what? That's not what separates us. That's what brings us together. That's what makes us as a church beautiful. The fact that we come from different places, and yet all of us coming from different places, different homes, different backgrounds, different languages, different continents, that we all have understood the universal truth, that even though we were sinners, when we were sinners, Christ left heaven. Not simply to keep us out of hell, but to change our lives. To step into us as we in common. Christ died for us and rose again so that we might all be forgiven. We might all be living, breathing testimonies of His grace. And as we become part of the body of Christ together as a church family here, we would know, we would find our place. Find our place to serve. Find our place to function. Not simply because as a church, that's what you do, but it's because of who we are that we serve as the Lord leads us. Not serving someone, some person, or each other even, but serving God. And as we serve God, as we serve each other, God uses us to share the message of hope with our community, which is dying and in need of the grace of God just as much as we want to. We go out there together as the body of Christ to share that love. With each of us being one body but different parts, as we find our function, we find our calling, in the direction that we need as a family. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you so much that you have brought us together. Lord, we each have a role to play in each kind of function. God, I pray that you would help us to discover that, but that's not something you would that you want from us, but God, it's something you want for us. You want us to find it because that's where we find joy. That's where we grow. That's where we continue to 